start by saying that uh, it's really great to be here. I came, uh, I was thinking about this last night, I think three times before, I maybe am off by one uh, as a student. And uh, so it's really awesome to be here uh, lecturing, but I was thinking back on my time as a student here and I really had the experience of feeling like I was drinking from the fire hose. Uh, and um, uh, so, uh, so I just wanted to say that that's okay, uh, right? I, I felt like, um, at the end of it, I felt like, okay, maybe I got, you know, 5% of what was going on. And then when I came back the second and third time, it was like, all right, I'm up to 7 or 8%. And then, um, <laughs> And then uh, when I got the invitation to come, uh, I was really excited about it, and then I saw who the other speakers were, and I was like, oh, these are friends and colleagues of mine. I, uh, I've co-authored papers with some of them. I'm definitely gonna get like at least 50% of the material uh, that's presented here. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I think that's just the way that this stuff works, and you'll have this experience where uh, potentially years later, you'll be walking down the street, uh, drinking a coffee, and you'll, it'll just pop in your head, and all of a sudden something will have made sense that didn't make sense the first time you saw it, and you'll think, ah, that's what that person was talking about. I, I get it now. And then there's no going back, right? The, your brain is just altered forever. Um, Okay, so uh, before I start, I just wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, what my uh, plans are for, uh, for the, um, the lectures that I have. So uh, I'm gonna talk about a, a few uh, different uh, things. They're all gonna be uh, connected. Uh, one is I'm gonna talk about different forms of operational semantics. So you've seen some uh, operational semantics presented here so far. That's mostly what I'm going to talk about uh, today, is I'm going to show you just some different ways that you might see operational semantics presented. This is really a kind of tutorial for how to read PL papers, okay? Because you'll see if you open up uh, ICFP or Popol Proceedings, almost every paper has an operational semantics for some language in it, and they're often formulated in different ways, okay? And so the first thing I'm gonna do is give you a little uh, primer on that, and uh, I think compared to a lot of the other material that you've seen so far, this is pretty basic stuff, okay? Um, and really the, the important thing is that, uh, for me to say is that there's nothing difficult going on here, okay? There's just, some notation and conventions and uh, syntax and uh, different choices of how to present things that will trip you up if you're not familiar with that stuff. So I'm gonna try to, uh, to show that stuff and um, hopefully uh, you can come away with this being able to quickly read uh, papers and understand what's going on in them. And also understand why authors made the decisions uh, to present things in the way they did. The other thing I'm gonna talk about is this tool uh, that I'm quite fond of uh, called RedX. Uh, and it's a domain-specific language for writing down the kinds of things that we see in programming language papers. So operational semantics, uh, type systems, any kind of you know, meta function or judgment about terms. Uh, so we'll see, we'll see some of that. So the first thing I'm gonna do is show you a bunch of operational semantics, and then the second thing I'm gonna do is show you how we can model them uh, in RedX. Okay, uh, and then the third thing that I wanna talk about is um, kind of my particular research area, which is on uh, abstract interpretation and uh, show you how we can build abstract interpreters, okay? And I don't wanna say too much about that until we, we get into it, but the, the main intuition is uh, if you wanna make predictions about what happens when you run your program, 
but you don't actually want to run your program, then what you want is, is abstract interpretation. Okay? And I'm going to build my abstract interpreter in Red X. I'll show you the semantics for it. So once we have the, the groundwork laid, uh, we can take a look at that, that stuff. Okay? All right. So I'm starting with a, a slide deck that I developed uh, for a talk I gave at PLMW in the last year or two. Uh, with this goal of showing people just the different forms of operational semantics that, uh, that you might encounter in a paper. Okay. So I think this question of why you would uh, develop a, an operational semantics has probably been addressed already. Um, but it's really, it's defining, uh, what it's doing is defining the meaning of, the, of your program by describing the actions carried out during the program execution. Okay. And you'll see that you'll see many different flavors of uh, these operational semantics. So you might see an evaluator semantics where somebody writes a program that evaluates uh, <coughs> programs in the language that you're defining and they take that as uh, the definition. Okay. Or you might see uh, a natural semantics or big step operational semantics. Uh, reduction semantics is another common one, or you might see uh, things formulated as abstract machines, so a little more low-level uh, presentation of, um, of what's going on, okay? And we're going to look at all of these, okay? So what's an operational semantics used for? Well, it can be used to specify a programming language. Uh, it can be used to communicate language design ideas precisely. Um, and it can also be used to validate claims about your language. Okay, this, is, this is the kind of thing you see in papers where somebody has a new idea uh, in the realm of programming languages and uh, you know, for either a new language feature, a new type system, and they make some claim about what this feature uh, gives you, whether that's maybe some, some variant of a type safety result or uh, runtime properties or whatever and in order to make that claim precise and validate it you define the operational semantics and you prove something about it uh, potentially in relation to some something else like the type system okay or you could uh, you know maybe you want to write a compiler for your language and prove it's correct well you need to appeal to uh, some notion of what it means to be correct, and that's where an operational semantics is going to come in. So I gave this talk uh, at PLMW that was uh, co-located with ICFP in 2016, and I just wanted to make it concrete that, you know, if we just pick a paper uh, out of the proceedings, and I just pick this one on context-free session types, which I know basically nothing about, and if you take a look at it, it's got a a claim in the contribution section about what they do. So they introduce a new uh, type system uh, that does something better than existing ones. Uh, and um, and the, claim, the claim here is that it captures type safe serialization. Okay, so they're gonna, the authors are gonna, when you're reading this paper, you should think the authors have set up uh, some claim and they're going to have to back it up some way. And the way that they do this is, a part of the way that they do this is they define a semantics for their language and then they prove something about their type system. And so this is what the semantics looks like in their, uh, in their paper. This happens to be a, uh, so they're defining a reduction relation here. This is going to be a reduction semantics. They're using, uh, evaluation context here, so this capital E, which I think is probably hard to see, but we'll, we'll get into uh, how all this stuff works, okay? So if you want to understand a paper like this, um, you'll need to understand something about reduction semantics and evaluation context and things like that, which I'll explain. So I'm going to pick a uh, non-Pacman complete programming language, <laughs> not even Turing complete. Uh, this is just the simplest, dumbest, uh, 
small toy uh, language that I can show you all of these different forms of the semantics in and get ac across the ideas, okay? So uh, this, is, this is just a language of very simple arithmetic expressions, okay? Um, but I'm just gonna use it to, to illustrate things, okay? So nobody cares about this as a programming language. Uh, it's just a vehicle, okay? So the first thing we do is define the syntax uh, of the language. Really what we're doing is uh, inductively defining a set, okay? So we're defining the set of terms. Uh, I'm calling that set A here. And you could see this spelled out in a kind of, uh, um, in a mathematical way saying, okay, if I is uh, an integer, then I is in the set A, okay? So our language includes integers. Uh, then we get to the, uh, the inductive cases. So if you have an expression E that's in the set of things A, then if you take the constructor pred and apply it to E, that is also in the set. And then we talk about the, the smallest set satisfying these constraints here. Okay. More likely what you're going to see is a grammar, okay, which is defining exactly the same set. Uh, okay, and so you have... Uh, uh, like we're defining the non-terminal E here as being either an integer or pred of E or suck of E and so on, okay? Uh, you also see things, and I know you've seen a lot of inference rules before, uh, so you could see things sort of defined with inference rules, which is just a, a kind of way of writing an implication. So you might see something like this saying, uh, it's just a change in notation, right, saying it. So, for example, case two here that uh, if E is in the set A, then pred of E is in the set A. Okay. And then we can talk, so if we write these, uh, uh, these rules, then we can actually show evidence for something being in the set by forming, forming a tree that shows, okay, plus of four and suck two is in our language of arithmetic. So now let's start talking about the, the dynamic semantics, the dynamics of this language. So the, the first uh, kind of semantics I'm gonna look at here is uh, a natural semantics, okay? It's a binary relation. Uh, it's a binary relation that relates expressions uh, in my language of arithmetic and uh, integers, okay? And the interpretation here is that we're saying uh, what, you know, if you write down an arithmetic expression, what does it mean? Uh, so here's just an example that if I add uh, four and two plus one, that should mean seven, okay? So we usually, you know, you write this in an infix notation here, okay? And uh, the, these are the rules for the natural semantics uh, of my language. Okay, so integers just evaluate to themselves. Uh, the uh, predecessor of an expression, well, if the expression evaluates to i, then the whole thing evaluates to i minus one. Okay, so I know this is all, this is all baby stuff, okay? But part of what I wanna do here is show that there's some, that even, even with the baby stuff, there's uh, some subtlety in what's going on, okay? so. Notice that we've got these variables like E and I uh, scattered throughout here. And really what you're writing, so when you see a rule like the, the pred one, you've got a pattern on the left side of the down arrow there, and it's binding the variable, the meta variable E here. And uh, there's a convention that, you know, what E could possibly match against uh, appeals to what's in that grammar, right? So, uh, so we're saying that if you've got something that's a predecessor and the thing that you constructed it around is an expression, and, it, and then the occurrence above the line, we're using that bound E to say that we get some uh, integer I, okay, so the I over there is a pattern variable, then we can uh, use I by subtracting one to compute 
the result here. Okay. All right, and then the rest of it, I think, is uh, is pretty straightforward. I think uh, maybe one thing that's um, that's worth pointing out here is sometimes what you'll see instead of writing writing out constructors, you'll see uh, people use more of a concrete syntax here, which make things really confusing because the way that you would write like uh, the plus rule is you'd say E1 plus E2 evaluates to I plus J if E1 evaluates to I and E2 evaluates to J. And uh, it can be confusing that here, the, here you're talking about the syntax, right? The constructor plus. Over here, you're talking about addition, right? The addition of I and J. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, right, so the, uh, the, the type of I and J is actually sort of implicitly specified by the use of the variables I and J. That's the, that's the kind of convention that you see a lot of in the way that people write papers. Uh, if we go back to that grammar, we go back to that grammar, I'm, I'm setting up a convention uh, in the rest of what I present that when I write a variable like I, that means I'm, it's ranging over integers, and E's ranging over expressions. Okay? All right. Uh, right, we could make this a little more explicit that, you know, I'm not constructing the plus of I and J on the right by saying something like it actually evaluates to some number K such that it's equal to I, I plus J. Okay, and then we can write proofs about what things evaluate to uh, by constructing trees that follow the rules that I've, that I've presented. So if you want to show that uh, that little expression evaluates to seven, th there's the proof of it. Okay. You could also write an evaluator for this language, and you pick some programming language to be your, your meta language here. I've chosen uh, OCaml. So I made a, a data type for expressions, uh, and I wrote a recursive function called uh, eval that uh, is really just a sort of transliteration of those, those rules that I showed before, okay, where things get sort of moved around, right? So the pred rule, uh, I'm saying, uh, so I'm matching the expression that we're evaluating, and uh, uh, what pred of E evaluates to is just whatever E evaluates to minus one. Okay. And then I can, the nice thing about this is I can run examples and try things out. Okay, we could talk about uh, structured operational semantics. Uh, here I'm talking about a small step semantics. So here I'm defining just another binary relation uh, but this happens to be a binary relation on uh, expressions, okay? So two expressions rather than an expression and an integer. Um, and the idea, the interpretation of this relation is in one step of computation, this is the, the new expression that I get to, okay? So... Uh, so here's an example where I'm adding uh, 4 and 2 plus 1, so I could uh, simplify the uh, successor of 2 in one step to 3, and then uh, plus of 4 and 3, I can simplify that in one step to 7, but it's important to note what's not in this relation is uh, that uh, 4 plus 2 plus 1 does not step to 7, okay, not in one step. Okay, so that's not in this, in this relation. So here what you do is you set up uh, rules that uh, can be categorized in, uh, in two parts. One is the rules that deal with the axioms of computation in your language. So here, notice my use of that convention I was talking about where now I'm not talking about predecessor of any old expression, 
I'm talking about predecessor of an integer. Okay? So if you write pred of 7, well, that takes a step to 6. Okay? Uh, and I do this for all of, uh, all of the things um, that I want to be able to reduce in my language. And there's no precondition on these, right? If you say pred of 7, you get 6. If you say successive, uh, successor of 5, uh, you get 6. Uh, sorry, I got the pred wrong, but you know what I mean. Um, uh, just because I can define the semantics of arithmetic doesn't mean I can do arithmetic. Um, <laughs> so the second part of the rules, uh, the second part of the rules are the contextual rules that tell you about, because, so one thing to observe here is if we look at this, uh, this initial example, right, according to the axioms, this doesn't take a step. Okay, there's no rule that applies here because there's no, there's no rule that has a pattern that matches that, that first expression that I have there. So you have to have rules about how to reduce things in the context of a larger expression. And these rules are all kind of brain dead. Okay, so this will make you, this is like writing a Java program where you feel good about writing a bunch of stuff, but you haven't really said much, you know. <laughs> uh, um, so, uh, right, if you have a predecessor of some expression and that expression can take a step, then you, you, the whole thing takes a step to pre uh, the predecessor of the thing that you step to inside, okay? And you do this for all the constructors uh, in your language and in each of the positions for sub-expressions, right? So we have a rule for multiply that says you can make progress on the left sub-expression or you can make progress on the right sub-expression. Okay, and now we've built up, uh, now we've built up the one-step reduction relation that relates that expression to that one and that expression to seven. Okay. All right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Natural number or integer? Integer. That's right. It, yeah, not that it makes a big difference, but yeah. Um, okay, and sometimes, so if you want to express this idea uh, more succinctly, you could just give part one and then say that you take the compatible closure of that relation, okay? Which is just a shorthand way of saying exactly the stuff that I spelled out here, right? So you allow, you allow the relation to be applied in each of the, uh, the context of each position of sub-expressions. Okay, and then this kind of semantics, right, we have a, you know, for each step of the computation, we can build proofs that that's what the expression steps to. Okay, and one thing that you'll, uh, you'll maybe observe here is that uh, this is really, unlike the evaluator semantics that we saw, this is really a relation and not just a function because you can take steps to different things. So here, to, uh, here's an example of an expression and uh, showing that it can step to two different things, right? Because there's two sub-expressions that we could simplify and we can make a choice about which one uh, to do it, okay? Uh, right, and then you can build up things on top of this one-step reduction relation uh, by uh, uh, taking the reflexive and transitive closure of it, okay? So this, this new relation called, you know, arrow star, it's built out of the underlying one-step relation called arrow, uh, and here I'm, here I'm writing it with the rules saying that, okay, if you can... Uh, if you can take a step from e to e prime, then the, the arrow star relation, which I'll call the zero or more steps uh, relation, so if you can get there in one step, you can get there in zero or more steps. Uh, you can always get to the same expression in zero steps. That's what this top right rule is saying. 
That's the reflexive closure of the relation. Uh, and then we can also take the transitive closure of the relation saying if you can get from E to E prime in zero or more steps and E prime to E double prime in zero or more steps, you can get from E to E double prime in zero or more steps. Okay. And now we can see that you know, there should be a correspondence between the first semantics that we saw uh, and this uh, reduction semantics. Uh, or this uh, small step operational semantics that we see, where, okay, so there may, be, there may be many paths going from E to the final result I, but it should always be consistent going in both directions with that first semantics that we saw. Yeah? Don't we only get implications in the right direction? Because there are many things that we single step in the, or that we many step to other things that we start with. So, okay, so that's a, that's a good question, right? Does, is the claim uh, really just in the right direction, saying that if we evaluate E and we get I, can we get to I in zero or more uh, steps of the reduction relation? So uh, you tell me, yeah. Yeah, so it's important, again, this comes back to, I don't know why, happening. One second. Uh, so this comes back to the fact that I is really ranging over integers. So it, it is true that if we had, uh, right, so, um, so this is only talking about the integers that you get to in zero or more steps, and then it, it works in both directions. This slide? Yeah. Uh, so remember that the, the arrow star is zero or more steps. Okay, so if you can get there in one step, can you get there in zero or more steps? Right, you can get there in one, so that's zero or more. So that's, wh that's why the first rule is there. Okay? Another question, actually. Yeah. Can you get back to your next slide? Next slide, yep. Ah, yeah, so, uh, so that's, a, that's an excellent uh, question. So uh, is I drawn from different sets here? So um, the answer here is no, because, so I think the reason the question comes up is because the I over here, remember that this relation on the right side is a relation between expressions. Uh huh. Right, so, uh, but this one is a relation between expressions and integers. But the way that I set up the language, integers are a subset of expressions. Okay, so it, it, it's okay, right? If you were, uh, if we were gonna model this in, say, ML, then uh, this wouldn't work out, and this would be of type int, and this would be of type expr, but it would be an expert that happens to be, you know, int of i. And so I'd have to touch this up a little bit. But because I'm just working in, you know, blackboard mathematics here, I can, I can make my set of expressions include just integers without a constructor in front of them. And it all works out. Yeah. Uh, so you don't, um, yeah, so the question is, do we have to show that uh, every expression uh, reduces or evaluates to an integer? Uh, that's actually, that is true in this language, right? Every expression you write uh, evaluates to an integer, uh, but it's not needed to make a claim like this, right? Because this is really teasing this apart, right? Two implications saying that if E evaluates to an integer, then it reduces to that same integer. So if it doesn't evaluate to an integer, then that's true already. Right? Uh, and in the other direction, it's, it's similar, similar reasoning. These are all really good questions, right? And I'm, I'm glad that we're, I thought that this might be uh, too simple. I think it's uncovering that like, there's a lot of subtlety that goes on 
even in these uh, uh, fairly, fairly routine kind of definitions, uh, and it's good to clarify these things. So uh, this is exactly what I was hoping for. All right, so <clears throat> now let me talk a little bit about uh, reduction semantics and introduce this idea of uh, an evaluation context. So in those, like I said, you know, we can break the rules uh, into two parts, the axioms and the uh, contextual rules. And if you think about every step of computation, you can also break that into two parts, right? One is, so these proofs always look like I'm applying a context rule, context rule, context rule, so on, so on, until I get up to an axiom, which is take a step, with some inner sub-expression that was there to begin with inside uh, the overall expression that we started with. Okay, so we can, uh, we can present the rules in that way by, so here I'm defining uh, just the axioms, I'm calling this relation A, but it's just the one step uh, axioms that we saw before. Uh, and then we can give grammatically, we can describe contexts. Okay, so here I'm saying contexts are uh, ranged over by C, Here's the grammar. So uh, a context is either a whole, that's what the square is here, or it's a uh, uh, pred with a context inside of it, uh, suck with a context inside of it, uh, plus with a context on the left, expression on the right. Okay, so uh, the intuition here is I'm just talking about an expression that has uh, a hole in it, right? There's some sub-expression that we've just decided to put our finger on uh, and talk about the context surrounding that, okay? And this is a grammar that, you know, makes the idea of, uh, so we, you, you'll see this, this kind of notation a lot in papers where you say uh, expression inside of it, right? And that's that idea of I've got this big, uh, like in this rule, I've got this context here, I'll call that C, and this is the expression that's in uh, this notation to mean two things, and you have to figure out, are, we, are you talking about the pattern or the construction, okay? So see, you'll see a rule like the following, if you have an expression that's inside some context C and that expression takes a step, then uh, the whole thing takes a step to that same context with E prime placing that expression E. So here we're talking about the pattern. Can we break the whole expression down into a context C and a sub-expression E prime? such that E, by one of the reduction axioms, takes a step to, uh, to E prime. And then here we're constructing an expression by taking the context from the left and plugging E prime into the whole. Okay? So there's sort of an overloading of the, the notation here. <coughs> okay, so that's, that's uh, how we could formalize context in terms of a grammar of really an expression with a, a single hole. The grammar enforces the property that there's only one hole in the expression. You can either have the thing not both. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about another uh, uh, form of the of semantic reductions. So we had this. Uh, we saw that there were reduce an expression. I want to talk about a particular strategy uh, or deterministic strategy for reducing 
expressions. Not okay. So here, okay. So this is my uh, standard reduction arrow, and it's going to pick a particular uh, particular strategy. So by one of the axioms, then it takes a reduction to that thing. That's the top rule. Um, if you, uh, if E can take a pride of E prime, that's sort of just like before, but the on the left and an exp oh, okay so do this as quickly as I can figure out how to do it yeah. awesome thanks yeah thank you You have to think about this for a minute, but this is really, this rules out any uh, choice about which sub-expression you want to reduce, right? Because um, if, uh, if you want to reduce the left sub-expression, you can go ahead and do it. But the only way that you can reduce the right sub-expression is if you've already fully reduced the left one. So this is enforcing a left to right uh, reduction strategy, right? The sub-expressions, at least for plus, uh, right? You do the left one first and then the right one. Now you can also uh, formulate this with uh, a notion of context. And uh, here we're, we're talking about a restricted set of contexts. So it's not all possible uh, expressions, but ones uh, that follow this grammar. Okay, so this limits sort of where you can put your finger on where to reduce. And that's the idea that the, the strategy is we pick an ordering to which sub expressions we reduce uh, next and characterized by this, this grammar. And, uh, and then we can have this. Uh, reduction in context rule up here in terms of this notion of evaluation context. Okay. Uh, and <clears throat> you'll see this, so this is, this is one of the things that was used in that paper that we saw at the beginning, was they had a, a definition of evaluation context. Uh, you'll see this a lot. Um, the way that I read these grammars is the occurrence of the non-terminal is telling you where you do reduction, right? So if you have a pred term, you do reduction inside of it. Uh, if you have a suck term, you do reduction inside of it. When you do a plus, you reduce on the left. After you're done reducing on the left, then you reduce on the right, okay? So you should be able to, to read these uh, these grammars and see what the strategy is. Okay. Okay, and uh, so here's a claim about uh, the the semantics I've presented so far, which is that uh, if you can get to an integer by the the standard strategy, then uh, you should be able to get there. Uh, by any reduction order uh, and vice versa. So the, the direction going this way is just obvious, right? It's sort of, this is a subset of reductions that we could have originally done, 
right? And you have to convince yourself of, of the other direction here. And it turns out to be true, but it's true because this is a really simple programming language. Uh, and it may, may not be true for uh, larger languages. Okay. okay, so now I'm gonna start talking about uh, machines, abstract machines. Uh, so, um, right, so here the idea is if you, uh, you might define a machine semantics if you want to talk uh, at a lower level about what's happening uh, when you run, run your programs, or you maybe need to formalize something that uh, is happening at a lower level, like maybe you want to uh, specify how garbage collection works in your language, and uh, then you probably need to talk about like, well, I've got a heap, and I've got a stack, and I crawl the stack, and all that stuff, and none of that detail is exposed uh, in the previous semantics that we've seen so far. So, so we've, we've sort of been uh, tunneling down into more detail about what's going on, right? We started off with the meaning of a program is just the integer that it stands for, uh, and then we talked about all of the possible uh, one-step computations that happen um, we picked, we could talk about a particular strategy that we're interested in, and here we're just talking about an even lower level way of interpreting programs. So here I'm gonna make a little stack machine for this simple language. Um, so, so a stack, S, is just a list of frames, and a frame is one of these things. Now you'll notice that this is just my grammar of evaluation contexts, except that it's, it's not inductive. I'm just saying you've got uh, uh, pred with immediately with a hole in it, right? There's no, there's no occurrence of F on, uh, uh, in any of the productions here in this grammar. Um, but the idea is that I'm gonna represent the evaluation context that I'm in now as a list of these frames. And the key thing here is that that list is going to present a kind of inside out view of the context, right? So if I'm an expression inside of a context, uh, then I can, then my stack is going to be a list of these, uh, simple evaluation context where if I look at the first thing, it's the immediately enclosing context. If I look at the next thing, it's the context around that. If I look at the next element, it's the context around that. So I can build up an, a, a view of the evaluation context by traversing my stack frames here. And I'm going to define uh, another a set of terms called serious terms they're not messing around. Uh, and these are, uh, these are the terms that are just not fully evaluated, okay? So if they have the potential to reduce, they're serious. If they're integers, their values, they're not serious, okay? They just lay around, all right? Uh, the backslash is uh, the set uh, minus. So, it's the set of all expressions A minus the integers, okay. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna define an yet another binary relation. Uh, this one is going to be on pairs of expressions and stacks, okay. So my, my machine, uh, I'll say a little bit about why it's, why it's called a machine in a minute. I mean, for now we can just think it's just an yet another um, reduction semantics. Um, but the, uh, the reductions in my sh machine can be broken into three categories, okay? One is uh, you do a real computation here, saying, okay, I've got an expression, it reduces by one of my axioms, 
therefore, you know, do it, and notice that the stack stays the same. That's just the reformulation of that evaluation context uh, rule that says if you've got an expression in a context and it takes a step, then the thing takes a step with the evaluation context staying the same. So here, the stack stays the same. That's, a, that's like do a real reduction. And then you have uh, reductions that uh, operate on the stack. Okay? So you're either pushing or popping on the stack. These correspond to, uh, these correspond to searching you know, deeper into an expression, building up a context to find the thing that reduces inside, or uh, building up the expression by plugging that thing back in. Okay? So, um, so the push rules are saying we're still looking for the thing that is going to be reduced. So you've got an expression that's the predecessor of something that's serious. Okay, so why did I write pred of s instead of pred of e? So s is serious, but I mean, what, what would be wrong with saying pred of e and then taking this transition? Yeah, it would overlap with this because pred of an integer reduces, right, to i minus 1. So the whole reason why I defined serious terms was so that these would be, these would be separate, non-overlapping rules, and that this doesn't, get, uh, this doesn't happen if uh, the expression inside is already an integer. So if, uh, if the inner expression is serious, then that means there's something in there that we should look for to reduce. So push the pred uh, uh, bit of the context onto the stack and keep looking at s for something to reduce. Okay? And the rest of the rules are similar. So if you've got a multiply of something serious, that's where you should uh, look to reduce. So push uh, the bit of the context that says, I'm inside of a multiplication where I'm going to have to multiply by e. Okay, once I'm once I finally reduce uh, s. So the push rules, notice, are defined by case analysis on the expression part. Okay, and they're always pushing a frame onto the stack. Yeah. Uh, so it's a binary relation on pairs of expressions and stacks. Expressions and stacks. That's right. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Uh, and then the third category of rules are the, um, the pop rules. Okay. So these are, I've, uh, I've got something... Again, the V should be an I for integer, but I've got something where the thing I'm looking at, the expression I'm looking at, is fully reduced. It's already an integer. So I know there's nothing to do here. So let's start peeling off the context and building up something until we find something that can reduce. So uh, these, notice these are defined by case analysis on the top frame of the stack. Okay, so that's how you know it's a pop rule, uh, where the expression is already fully reduced. So uh, if the top frame is pred, well, reconstruct the expression by plugging the integer into the pred bit of the context. And, now, and that'll be the next transition that you make. And potentially, right, we know actually that that will, the next step is going to be uh, an axiom to reduce pred of that integer. Okay. In fact, uh, you will often find machines that are sort of optimized by uh, a limit by inlining the uh, axiom rules into the pop rules. So you get rid of uh, you get rid of the reduce rules, and instead you would write this as uh, 
i, where the top frame is pred, reduces to i minus 1 with the rest of the stack. Okay. I sort of like it, I mean, why do, why do we need to optimize our mathematical definitions? I kind of like it like this, where everything breaks down nicely and we can just reuse our original uh, axioms. Uh, but I'm just telling you that because you might encounter that and think, why did they do that? Okay, um, okay so uh, <clears throat> now we have this little uh, stack machine for our language. And I can make a claim about its relationship to those standard reductions that we saw uh, earlier. So according to the standard reduction strategy, if you can reduce from E to I, then I claim that uh, running the machine on uh, that expression in the empty stack uh, will get you to I in the empty stack. So we have, the idea here is that we should have a faithful uh, machine for interpreting things in our standard reduction relation. And the reason why it's a, it's a machine is if we think about these operations, um, right, if we think back to the standard reduction relation, that's a, that's a fairly complicated rule to implement, right? It's saying if there exists a decomposition of the term into an expression, uh, an evaluation context, uh, big E and with a little term uh, E inside of it, then reduce it, you know, so you're decomposing everything, reducing something, uh, and recomposing it all in one step, right? Uh, that's a, that's not like an operation that you get on, in like x86, right? Uh, uh, yeah. Sure. Where I had what? Pop rules, huh? Uh, uh, yes, you're exactly right. Yeah, this is a bug. Uh, uh, okay, so, um, uh, okay, so y you're correct. Okay, so technically I think this is fine, uh, but I should have written it, uh, I should have written it as uh, uh, where this E should be an integer variable. Okay, why is it technically fine? It's technically fine because the only, because E also matches integers, and uh, the only thing that it could possibly be once it's been pushed on the stack is in fact an integer. So this rule is like acceptable, but uh, confusingly written, and I should have done a better job with that. Uh, good catch, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, like when I made this claim, why didn't I just say? Oh, here. So, okay, ask your question again. Oh, okay, yeah. So, the, what's the difference between uh, the arrow and the bar arrow relation? The arrow relation lets you reduce anywhere, right? So you can have many different uh, ways of reducing to i, like with many different possible sub-expressions getting you to the final integer. Whereas this one, I mean, you have to convince yourself of this, but this one, there's only one path. For any expression in integer i, there, it's a deterministic strategy for getting you there. That's the difference. Okay. Uh, right. Okay. So what I was, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, what's the difference between natural semantics and denotational semantics? One is I'm not I'm not talking about 
denotational semantics. So uh, <laughs> maybe that's a cheap way of answering that question. So, um, so the idea with denotational semantics, in some sense, the natural semantics is a denotational semantics, right? Because uh, we're mapping uh, expressions into uh, uh, their meaning, which is integers. But that's like a really simple uh, denotational semantics. So I guess in some sense, it is an instance of a denotational semantics, but not a very interesting one. Uh, it is, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, we can also show some of these things labels as different things, right? Uh, I'm sorry, say that again? Uh, but you can, uh, for the function of this language, it also has labels as different things, right? Mm -hmm. So that's also a different semantics? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think these are all instances of labeled transition systems. I just haven't any labels on anything, but yeah, and we could and talk about that, yeah. Okay, um, okay, but I just want to make this point about the machine semantics is uh, in some, se it, the, you know, I'm saying it's a lower level thing in that um, if we think about the implementation here, what does it involve? Well, it involves adding, subtracting, multiplying, things like that, right, from the, you know, the immediately apparent expression that we have here, or looking at uh, what the head constructor of the expression is, okay, so that's an easy operation, and then pushing onto a stack, or examining the top frame of the stack and popping things off and, you know, uh, uh, constructing something very simple here. So all of these are really simple instructions that we could implement in a straightforward way, and none of them are like uh, cost, uh, you know, uh, have an operational cost proportional to the size of the expression or quadratic in that or things like that, right? These are all simple, which is why we would call it uh, a machine semantics because uh, it has a simple implementation here, okay? So that's, uh, that's the pizza, right? That's, uh, um, that's um, instances of all these different uh, semantics uh, that, um, that I mentioned at the beginning. These are all really common things that you would see uh, in a PL paper. And I know it's for this uh, really simple language, but um, an expression that my advisor is really fond of is that, you know, thinking about uh, this in like that paper that we saw, it's the same stuff, it's just more cheese on the pizza, okay? <laughs> like you, you understand all of this stuff now, or at least you've been presented all of this stuff uh, now, and, uh, and that, that's it, okay? So I wanna look at um, uh, quickly just some, you know, some toppings that we could, we could put on the pizza, okay? So, uh, Hopefully you like, uh, like me, like functional programming, so we might add functions to our language. Uh, so we'd extend the syntax with application and functions and variables, okay? And now my notion of fully reduce, excuse me, fully reduce things uh, includes both integers and functions. Uh, and I'll use the meta variable v to range over values. Okay, now uh, uh, I know you've seen uh, at least uses of substitution because I saw uh, Bob Harper uh, talk about this in his first uh, lecture online and uh, there's some tricky parts which Bob mentioned and uh, I'm not going to show those. Um, <laughs> uh, all right, um, so here's the natural semantics once you know we add uh, uh, these new features to the language. So here's, um, here's a call by name uh, interpretation of the language. So if you have an application and the left side evaluates to a function uh, and you replace uh, the argument E1 uh, in for X 
uh, in the body of the function, uh, then we get V back. Uh, this is not compositional now, so uh, might not satisfy your notion of a denotational semantics, okay. Um, but is the natural semantics for uh, call by name here. Okay, and so if the body with the argument replace, uh, substituted in for X uh, evaluates to V, then the whole thing evaluates to V. Uh, here's the call by value variant of the natural semantics. So similarly, if the, uh, the left side evaluates to the function and the right side evaluates to some value V and substituting that value V1 for X gives you V, then the whole thing gives you V. So here we're expressing that the argument must evaluate to a value. Okay, the, here, let's look at the reduction semantics. So here I'm defining uh, an axiom called beta, it's just a binary relation on expressions, saying that if you have an application with a function uh, sitting there on the left side, then you can uh, uh, substitute the argument for x in the body of the function. Uh, we can extend our grammar of context, right? We have a new notion of expression, so our uh, grammar of context grows. We can define the um, uh, compatible closure of our uh, one-step uh, axioms by taking the union of our laws of arithmetic and beta and now we get the one-step reduction relation for, uh, for this language. Okay, we could talk about uh, a restricted version of that axiom. So here's the, uh, the beta V relation. Notice I, the change was instead of the argument being any expression, it must be a value. Then we can substitute the value for uh, X in the body E. Context stay the same, but we just use that different, uh, if we use that different uh, beta axiom, then we can get a different notion of one step reduction. And this is really like the, this is the call by value <coughs> lambda calculus, okay? You can reduce anywhere within the expression as long as uh, the, uh, when you're applying a function, the argument is already fully reduced, okay? Yeah. So these two things are, so A uh, and beta are relations. Uh, and when I say the union of them, I'm just talking about, if we think of them as sets of pairs, right? A relation as sets of pairs that are in, are related, then union is just the union of those sets of pairs, okay? So I, I mean, <clears throat> in other words, if E can take a step to E prime by the axioms of arithmetic, or E can take a step to E prime by the beta V axiom, then it takes a step in this relation, okay? Yeah. Uh, no, we don't, have to, we don't have to think of them separately. Uh, it's just, yeah, I guess, I just didn't want to uh, rewrite the A axioms. It's just good software engineering of reuse here, right? <laughs> okay. We could talk about standard reductions, right? So we pick a particular strategy uh, for reducing terms, right? So instead of having many ways of reducing a, an expression, we just have a single uh, strategy. We do that by limiting the uh, notion of context to an evaluation context that says, okay, so here uh, we're saying, remember my, my way of reading these grammars is saying if you have an application, you can reduce the left side, okay? And that's it, right? It doesn't say anything about the right. You can't reduce the right. That's not in the grammar, okay? And then this is our, then we get the uh, notion of standard reduction, which is just saying, you reduce the left side of, um, uh, okay, no, uh, the left side of applications. The other thing that this is saying is that you don't get to reduce under, uh, in, in function bodies, right? That's also taken out of uh, 
right? E compared to C in our context here uh, is different in those two ways, right? The right-hand side of applications don't reduce, and the body of functions don't reduce. And you can convince yourself that this is, this is really uh, a function. It's uh, deterministic about what you take a step to. Okay, we could also talk about standard call-by-value reductions, re, uh, reusing our beta v axiom, uh, changing up our uh, evaluation strategy by the definition of context here to say you evaluate the left side of an application. Once that's fully evaluated, only then do you get to uh, evaluate the right side or reduce the right side, I should say. Okay, uh, here's the machine view. Okay, so just like before, we've got a list of stack frames. Since we have uh, new contexts, we'll have new frames. So the frames that I'm adding here are, uh, this, is, this is going to be a machine for call by value. So it's saying, uh, if you have a serious, uh, if you have an application with a serious term on the left, uh, you can push uh, an app frame with the argument uh, onto the stack. Uh, or if you uh, have an application with a value on the left and a serious term on the right, you can push this, uh, this stack frame. You would remove that if you were doing call by name in the same way that you would remove that context uh, from the grammar. Okay, and then uh, push, pop, uh, and reduce uh, are basically what we saw before. Okay. So it's just more, more cheese on the pizza. Uh, let's, uh, I've got a little over 10 minutes. Let me just show you uh, some more stuff, okay? More cheese on the pizza. Um, so uh, here's how you could do exceptions. So I'm gonna grow my syntax. I'm gonna include, uh, Constructors for arrays and a try. Uh, here's my uh, evaluate. So um, one thing that happens once you get sort of practiced at this stuff is uh, you can just look at these definitions and you sort of know how things are going to work out. Okay, so uh, I grow the the language of expressions. Uh, I define my evaluation context. You can read off from this how things are going to reduce, okay? So if you have a raise, you reduce the inner expression. Uh, if you have a try, you reduce uh, the sub-expression on the left, but you don't do anything with the, the thing on the right because that's your exception handler. Uh, and what's gonna happen is, you know, once you finally raise something, that's when that will, that will trigger a reduction on the right. So, um, so this example is going to, up until now, our use of evaluation context is really just kind of a shorthand for uh, writing all of those uh, structure operational semantic rules that involve you know, uh, reducing things uh, in sub-expressions. But here we're gonna do something a little more interesting. So I'm gonna talk about a particular kind of uh, evaluation context, T, which is just uh, an evaluation context, you know, except there's no try, uh, there's no try in the context, okay? So, uh, right, okay, so it's a context with, without any try in it. And here are my, uh, here are my axioms. So the first two are my axioms for reducing uh, try and raise uh, expression. So if you have try and the uh, inner expression on the left is fully evaluated, it didn't, that means it didn't raise an exception, so eliminate the try, right? So you reduce it by throwing away the, uh, the handler XE. On the other hand, if you have a try, and you have inside of it an expression that is itself 
composed of an evaluation context with no try inside of it and arrays inside of it with a fully evaluated value, then you can take a step to uh, calling the exception handler here uh, where you pass V uh, to the right-hand side of the handler substituting for, by substituting for X. Okay. So <clears throat> this is one of the things that's powerful about formulating in terms of an evaluation context is because you've given, because we can now give that context a name here, we can do things with it like throw it away. So notice that part of the context, the, the capital T here, gets tossed away. All right. But still our notion of standard reduction uh, is defined in terms of the, these you know, three uh, computational axioms of arithmetic, beta, and the exception handling stuff. Okay. You could also implement things like control operators like call CC. I'll skip over this. Okay. Um, all right, so let me just uh, uh, let me just wrap up. Right, we've seen a bunch of different forms of operational semantics, uh, uh, which are all just methods for defining the meaning, the the meaning, the dynamic meaning of programs by describing the actions carried out during the program's execution, and we've seen. Uh, We've seen those as natural semantics. Uh, we saw an evaluator in the beginning. We sort of didn't come back to that, but uh, trust me, you can write an evaluator for functional programs. Um, uh, and we've seen structured small step operational semantics, reduction semantics with evaluation context, standard reduction relations, which is just about fixing the, uh, a strategy and we've seen abstract machines, like the little stack machine, and then later the stack machine for, uh, for, lambda, or for functional programs. Okay, um, and why you would make a choice about which one to use really depends, it's just driven by what you're trying to do. Okay, so you're gonna, you'll wanna make uh, a choice that's appropriate for the thing that you're uh, that you're trying to do. Um, one thing that I didn't talk about but I think is worth mentioning is that all of these things can be related to each other uh, in, um, in systematic ways, okay? So I sort of just showed them to you, right? Here's one thing, here's another thing. I claim that there's a relationship between them that we could uh, prove after the fact, uh, but in fact, uh, you uh, people have studied how you, let's say, write an evaluator and derive the abstract machine from it. Uh, and that's all very cool work, and that's how I learned a lot of this stuff in the beginning. And so if you're interested in that, I, you should take a look at Olivier Donvy's work on uh, what he calls the functional correspondence and the uh, syntactic correspondence <coughs> for interderiving all of these things. Okay. All right, so um, I'll conclude there. Next time what we're gonna do is actually implement uh, basically all of the stuff that we saw today in Redux, yeah. Uh, for that reference, how do yeah. you spell that name? Uh, Donvy, D-A-N-V-Y. So two questions. One is that it seems like there are two things you'd want to use semantics for. One is implementing a language and the other is proving things about the language. Could you or would you like to give a concrete example of your middle communicating ideas? Sure. I mean, is, there something, is there something that's not specifying or proving? That's my first question. And my yeah. second question is, could you just give some rules of thumb about which of these semantic techniques map most nicely onto the different use cases. Yeah, okay, so uh, yeah, those are, those are great questions. So um, a good example of this uh, communicating ideas, I think is actually gonna come up uh, in what Sam presents. So Sam is, going to, uh, Sam is going to talk about a language feature 
called contracts that uh, are implemented in uh, many different programming languages, but he's mostly going to talk about it in the context of Racket. And, um, and he's going to show you, maybe not today, but he will eventually show you the semantics of contracts as a way of uh, communicating what's really going on uh, with the contracts, okay? That has the additional uh, use of, you know, he's uh, proven some things about how contracts work, but I think most importantly, uh, uh, the semantics is developed in order to talk to people like the people in this room and say precisely what's going on. In the same way that uh, what I showed about exception handlers, I think actually precisely communicates what happens uh, um, uh, when you have a language with exceptions and, uh, and how it works, right? Um, uh, and the other was, uh, what are some rules of thumb uh, for uh, choosing here? And I would say, okay, so uh, one, of the, one of the things that might come up if you were using a natural semantics for our functional language is the, the semantics that I showed uh, doesn't say anything about non-terminating programs. Okay? If you think about that relation, uh, the relation between expressions and values, Right? There, if the expression is a program that doesn't terminate, then it's just not in the relation at all. Right? And uh, uh, so if you want to make a claim that involves programs that potentially run forever, that's maybe not the right, uh, the right tool. And what you want to do is look at uh, a small step operational semantics. That comes up when you do you, the usual way that you prove uh, type safety, right, the, uh, the usual claim is that if the program is well typed, then either it runs forever or it produces a value uh, that's uh, uh, the value uh, uh, of the, the type that the program has, okay? Uh, and uh, the, the sort of most common way that you prove it is uh, using a uh, small step reduction relation as your semantics. Um, uh, you might talk, so you'll uh, talk about standard reductions usually if you want to talk about a particular uh, implementation of a programming language, right? Most programming languages don't uh, implement the interpretation of programs by exploring all possible uh, reductions that you could do most of them uh, have uh, settled on a strategy for how things get uh, evaluated. And uh, uh, so you'll see standard reduction relations a lot when you're talking about like a particular implementation of a programming language and you want to reason about it. Uh, and then abstract machines, like I said, this is really getting into, if you want to be able to talk about the low-level things that are going on, then uh, uh, then you'll want to formulate it in terms of uh, a machine semantics. Okay, so um, right, if we want to talk about, uh, let's say, uh, proper tail recursion, right, which is a property about the growth in the size of the stack, well, we need to talk about. Uh, the machine model of that, because there is a stack, right? And there isn't a stack in the standard reduction relation. So those are some examples, not, I guess, that not good rules, but that sort of gives you a sense of uh, uh, at least some examples of, of where you would use each of these, okay? Any other questions? All right, thank you.